Hello, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. Pretty stoked today. Um, this is the Proving Ground area. We got some awesome information lined up for today. I'll be your spiritual guide slash information highway uh, jester. So uh, before we get going, I want to get to a couple housekeeping items. First, we need to thank all of our sponsors, of course, our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and then our gold sponsors, Toyota, Prisma Cloud, and PlexTrack. Of course, without their support, none of this would really be possible. The other thing to remember, please, silence your cell phones. Nobody likes the loud buzzing going off in the middle of presentation. Also, since this is being recorded and streamed in some cases, um, we don't want to interrupt the, the, the folks at home that are watching. Um, during the Q&A, please make sure you pop up to the microphone here to use it. Otherwise, we can't hear you, and the folks at home can't hear you. So please make sure you do that and use it. Um, and then, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Yuval Zakaria to talk about the enemy at the gate, detecting and stopping account takeover. Please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming here today. Um, my name is Yuval. I live in Israel, Tel Aviv. And my background is mostly from A200 Intelligence Unit in the Israeli Defense Force. Over the past two years, I've been working for Hunters, an Israeli startup that builds a SOC platform. In this talk, I'm going to introduce uh, the account takeover research that we did in the team. Uh, talk, a, talk a bit about our team's unique approach, provide some real life examples, and share some hands-on experiences. So what's the problem? And why is everyone talking about account takeover? The three primary ways in which attackers access an organization are stolen credentials, phishing, and exploitation of vulnerabilities. According to DBIR reports, more than 50% of the attacks this year have used stolen credentials for initial access, which makes it the number one attack vector. When talking about web application attacks, the number are even higher, 86%. Let's dive into some real world examples. I'm sure you all heard about Lapsos. Not so long ago, Lapsos had access to T-Mobile's network by compromising employee accounts, either by buying link credentials or through social engineering. This gave Lapsos access to T-Mobile's internal tools, including Atlas, a tool used for managing customer accounts. Through this employee account access, the hackers were in a position to carry out SIM swap attacks, where hackers reassign a target cell phone number to a device under their control. This allows for the interception of phone calls and text messages that can be used to further break into a victim's account and also obtain two-factor authentication codes. The, ha the hackers were able to steal source code from a range of companies' projects, just as the group has done with Samsung, Microsoft, and Globant. And this is not the end. Google Fi breach resulted from the hack on T-Mobile, which impacted 37 million customers by exposing their phone numbers. The attack was essentially an API scraping exploit, allowing the attacker access to records of basic customer contact and profile information. Well, that's not a big surprise. Um, in MITRE attack framework, there are more than 50 references of different attack groups leveraging credential, credential theft. And as you can see, the list of breaches is just getting longer and longer. So what's the problem? And why is it so challenging to detect? We are well aware that the companies that we just saw their logos all utilize some form of identity provider. While multi-factor authentication is highly recommended and useful, it is not bulletproof. Detecting account takeover during the initial access phase is indeed possible, but it's not so easy. Whether it involves credential theft from the dark web, social engineering, or supply chain attack, the attacker enters in the king's rush. The red carpet is laid out before them leaving defenders with limited options. However, there are steps that can still be taken. 
Account takeover is more than just getting authenticated. We divide it to two different stages, access acquisition and access leverage. Access acquisition is often considered a singular event. By resetting credentials and invalidating all sessions, the attacker access can be blocked. However, incidents like Lapsos have taught us that insiders can hand delivered credentials to attackers enabling access without triggering failed login alerts, requiring enumeration or generating failed MFA challenge alerts. This allows attackers to bypass the traditional steps associated with account takeover, even without reaching any accounts within the organization. Access leverage has become increasingly dangerous with the rise of single sign-on, SSO, and identity services as they become a single point of failure. Gaining access to an SSO or identity service authenticated account essentially grants the keys to the kingdom. In this talk, we will explore one of the most interesting attacks witnessed this year within one of our customers' environment. We will cover both the access lever leverage and access acquisition aspects, explaining how every step within the kill chain can be detected. Let's see that in action. It begins with when the attacker somehow gets John's credentials, whether they have been leaked or purchased. Then they bypass MFA and gained access to, a, to John's Azure account. Afterward, they sent a phishing email from John's compromised email account to Sarah. Sarah clicked on the malicious link, and malware is installed on her computer. This malware steals our Okta session cookie, enabling the attacker to hijack the session and gain a temporary access key to the company's AWS account. In order to remain persistent in the network, the attacker creates a persistent AWS access key, allowing them to exfiltrate and manipulate data. We're going to cover some detection opportunities for the techniques involved in this attack chain. Our focus extends beyond simply identifying these techniques. We will also talk about noise reduction methodologies for very well-known detection rules and avoid the issue of alert fatigue. Lastly, we will discuss the workflow for security responders during investigations. Let's begin exploring these detection techniques and strategies in detail. The first step that the attacker perform is to log in using Jones' credentials. Since the attacker and Jones are not located in the same place and probably not even in the same country, we are supposed to be able to detect this using impossible travel rule, also known as superhuman activity. Impossible travel is about detecting two consecutive logins from two different IP addresses by the same user. user with the required traveling speed between them being impossible in the specific time frame. Impossible travel may indicate the logins were not made by the same person, therefore rising the suspect the user was compromised by a malicious actor. Sounds easy, right? Well, apparently it's not so easy. Simply running this rule on one of our bigger customers' login logs a unified schema contains login logs from different data sources, including identity providers, homegrown application, clone providers, and basically any SaaS app that you can think about, raised more than 9 million alerts per one week. That's, of course, not a number that any analyst, talented and experienced as he is, will be able to deal with. In order to reduce noise and find a needle in the ashtray, we need to understand the root causes for false positives and, and identify common patterns so we can develop noise reduction methodologies without making significant compromise. The first problem that comes to our mind when developing impossible travel detection is how not dealing with VPNs, NAD, and proxies. 
These tools are used legitimately in organizations to remotely log into different services. As I mentioned earlier, impossible travel is all about SaaS application login logs. But what if we leverage GDR logs to identify IP addresses that are being used by a large number of users? If more than, let's say, 10 endpoints with sensors installed are, being, are seen behind an IP address on a regular basis, we can assume this IP address is the office not or the company's VPN and therefore not generating an alert for it. This noise reduction methodology reduces like 35% of the alerts. Continuing this line, another common false positive pattern that we identified is IPs that are being used on a regular basis. Maybe it is not a company's VPN, but hey, what if I'm logging in from an IP address that, is, that has an EDR agent that is seen in the data every single day? And what if I'm logging in from a phone, from the office Wi-Fi? If the IP logged in is seen behind a computer that has an EDR agent installed or used to log in for, uh, to various SaaS applications for a long period of time, we consider it trustworthy and tag it as an organizational IP. And if both IPs in the alert are trustworthy, it is less likely to be a malicious actor. Okay. We progressed a little, but we still have too many alerts than we can handle. Superhuman activity, as you can guess from its name, aims to catch a human attacker. Understanding that this thesis is not aimed to catch, uh, to catch compromised service accounts, we decided to eliminate logins from non-user accounts. But how can we identify these? For example, Office 365 provides user type in their login logs, and therefore service accounts can be ignored with a simple SQL filter. In Okta, for example, we can tag usernames prior the detection phase. We use specific events that are only sent by services and tag these usernames as services for future usage. Then in the detection phase, we can use this asset tagging to filter out non-human assets. Finally, for the last noise reduction methodology, one of the key questions we ask is, does this traveler consistently travel between two specific coordinates? We aim to establish a baseline of statistically significant travels involving two coordinate spurs of locations for the same users. With a baseline in place, we can then detect any deviations from the established patterns. When a user's travel behavior significantly deviates from its usual pattern, it raises suspicion and triggers an alert. Through the combined implementation of noise reduction methodologies, including identifying non-human accounts, creating an organizational IP baseline, and filtering out rerouting tools, we achieved a remarkable decrease in the number of alerts. This reduction from millions to just a few dozens allows security teams to efficiently handle and investigate the remaining alerts. Okay, so what's next? The attacker logged in to John's account without having to meet the MFA requirement. But how is that even possible? Alas, too and other modern authentication methods use Identity Provider, like Azure Active Directory, to enhance the authentication security using MFA. When the user authenticates successfully, he's granted an access token. But what about devices that cannot utilize 2FA? Think about the old printer located down the hall in your office. For legacy devices and applications, OS2 includes a flow called Resource Owner Password Credentials, ROPS. This flow allows the, uh, allows the device to receive a token using only the user's credentials without the requirement of 2FA. For example, if your old printer needs to send you an email indicating it's out of ink, it must connect to the Office 365 mail server via its authentication methods, Azure Active Directory, Microsoft enables the ROPS mechanism for the SMTP protocols 
on the Office 365 mail server by default to provide a way for legacy application to adopt modern authentication without requiring developers to update the application itself. Exploiting this mechanism, the attacker used John's credential to send and receive an email to send an email on his behalf, bypassing the need for MFA authentication. So how can we detect this? Microsoft utilizes a user agent called bav 2 which stands for Basic Authentication Version 2 Resource Owner Password Credentials. It is used to identify basic authentication from legacy protocols. While it is barely documented, bav 2 is a mechanism developed by Microsoft that enables all applications relying on legacy authentication to seamlessly switch to OS2 using ROPS flow in real time. Simply looking for this special user agent will provide a really decent and high fidelity alert. But this is only a user agent. How can we investigate this kind of alert? First, we can correlate the source IP with the EDR agent to determine if it is associated with known endpoints within our organization. Next, we can analyze uh, the previous Azure login activity. If this device always uses a legacy protocol to authenticate, it is most likely to be a bad practice than an attacker. Additionally, we investigate the compromised email account for any, indi for any indicators of business email compromise such as creation of forwarding rules or sending emails around the login time. As a mitigation step, consider applying the block legacy OS policy in conditional access policies. This policy can help prevent further exploitation through legacy authentication protocols. Okay, let's recap what we had so far. The attacker obtains stolen credentials and gains access to John's account. They used an MFA bypass technique, granting access to send and receive emails. Taking advantage of this access, the attacker sends a phishing email to Sarah. When Sarah clicks, malware is installed on her computer. This becomes the pivotal moment from access acquisition to access leverage. Once the attacker has control over Sarah's account, his objective is to gain access to valuable assets and maintain persistent if possible. And what provides access to everything? The identity provider. Now let's dive into the technique of octosession hijacking, which is a serious threat in this situation. Let's briefly go, ho go over uh, of how sessions are managed in Okta. When a user starts a session in Okta, a unique session identifier is generated, and relevant information is stored both on the client side and the server side. The session cookies contain session information required for authentication. During the SSO process, the user's web browser sends a request to Okta. Since the attacker has malware installed on Sarah's computer, he can steal the session cookie from the web browser and use it to hijack the session. So what does it look like? Octa session contains two main events in the initialization phase. Octa session starts and Octa SSO login. We're basically looking for something that looks unusual in the session. For example, the user agent. The first step in our Octa session hijacking detection is to aggregate the events based on the Octa session ID. By doing so, we can identify unique sessions and focus on the first session initialization event within our defined cell window. This allows us to pinpoint the start of each user's session. Next, we examine whether there are multiple IP addresses, OS, or browser variations associated with each Octa session ID. To reduce noise and improve the accuracy of our detection, we utilize the Levinstein distance algorithm. We don't want to alert every time someone just updates their Chrome version, but we do want to alert if there are significant differences 
in the user agent, such as different OS versions. This Levenstein distance algorithm uh, measures the similarity between different OS or browser variations by calculating the minimum numbers of operations required to transform one string into another. By applying this algorithm, we can better identify similar variations and distinguish them from significant differences that may indicate session hijacking attempts. Well, in any Okta hijacking successful attack, the attacker is sub subject to the constraints of the stolen sessions, both its duration and the resources accessible during the session. If the legitimate user logs out or is log out, logged out by an administrator, the session cookie is invalidated. With that in mind, following the successful hijacking of the Okta session, the attacker establishes a persistent AWS access key that will later on allow him to exfiltrate and manipulate data. The detection we are going to cover is to discuss covers both creation of new persistent access key and leaked credential usage. The thing is that creation and usage of AWS uh, persistent access key is very normal, happens all the time. So how does this detection work? Firstly, we retrieve AWS CloudTrail logs and filter out IAM users. This ensures that we focus on non-temporary users who have the ability to perform API actions. We also exclude AWS internal IP addresses, since these internal IPs are typically associated with AWS services that are not indicative of external access. Additionally, we filter out requests that are sent from within a VPC by checking for null VPC endpoints. This helps us identify requests originating from outside a VPC environment. Next, we look for instances where an access key is used for the first time from a specific IP address. Although it is generally not considered a security best practice to use the same access keys from multiple new IP addresses, there are legitimate situations where this can occur within an organization. Factors such as third-party integrations or services, as well as a distributed workforce, may lead to access from various locations. To distinguish abnormal usage from legitimate usage involving multiple APs, we create a baseline using time series calculation. This baseline helps establish a normal pattern of IP usage for each access key, and to alert only when it deviates from the standard. OK, back to our attack scenario. Through this talk, we have explored several critical detection opportunities and investigation workflows to detect both steps of account takeover. We began by discussing the detection of impossible travel, focusing on noise reduction methodologies and avoiding alert fatigue. Next, we talked about Azure MFA bypass techniques emphasizing the importance of investigation workflow, analyzing agile login activity, and investigating business email compromise. We moved on to the access leverage phase, where we explored the threat of Okta session hijacking and its detection mechanisms. Lastly, we examined abnormal usage of AWS access keys, establishing baseline to identify potential key leaks and unauthorized key usage. As we wrap up this talk, I want to leave you with three important points to remember. First, MFA alone is not sufficient to guarantee security. It is crucial to implement effective detection mechanisms to identify both access acquisition and access leverage, even with MFA in place. Second, data source correlation. Correlating data from multiple sources helps us reduce noise and provides a better contextual understanding of potential threats. And lastly, detection is just the first step. An effective security responder workflow is essential to mitigate and respond to security incidents. Thank you very much for your time. I will be happy.